Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome back. Um, for those of you, welcome to those of you who were not able to be with us last evening. We uh, have a really interesting and full uh, schedule for this afternoon, but we would like to begin today um, continuing our conversation and uh, around um, our good intentions and the unintended consequences of um, our uh, understanding as of racism, race in Canada and in ourselves. As we continue this afternoon, um, I've, I hope that we can um, listen with open hearts, open minds and open spirits, and that we will be able to hear truth spoken and speak truth to one another. As we begin, I would like to light two candles and I have a little table next to me that I'm going to place these two candles uh, on as I light them. And the candles are our a symbol of light in the darkness of our world, light in the darkness of our, uh, to be fully enlightened around um, questions of race and understanding uh, one another. And as I light the candles, uh, other members of the planning committee and panelists are going to be uh, reading uh, names uh, that we want to remember and reflect on. The names are uh, some of those people who have suffered uh, injustice and uh, violence and some who have passed away as a result of injustice and violence. I will light the candles if my colleagues could please begin to read the names. First, we'd like to remember um, those that the system has failed due to in the injustice of how the laws affect uh, African Americans and African Canadians. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to remember those that have passed this year um, due to police brutality. Uh, George Floyd is one, Breonna Taylor. I would like to remember, uh, is there a third name? I would like to remember those affected by the events in Sonyaville with the First Nations lobster fishery and Jacob Blake was shot by in Wisconsin. And I would like to acknowledge and remember Shana Moore and Emily Wolfrey. I would also like to remember Ahmad Marquez Arbery. I'd like to remember Colton Bushy and Barbara Kentner, Joyce Eshwan. And we know that these are um, just a few of the names that come right to mind because they've been in the news, but we know there are so many more. So if you know of more and want to share them, please put them in the chat um, and you can share them with us after. You can include an explanation if you like, but thank you for taking the time to help us remember. And as we continue, may we come to this time together this afternoon with compassion of heart, clarity in our speaking, grace in our awareness, courage in our thoughts and actions, and generosity in our love. I invite you, if you would like to, I know uh, those who were present last night did put into the chat uh, who you are, where you are located, and the territory uh, uh, that you find yourself um, in as well as if you choose uh, your particular pronouns that you uh, would like people to refer to you as. And 
Now I will turn it over to Diane for a land acknowledgement. So again, I would like to take a moment out of respect to recognize the land that we are living in and working on across Canada, which is the traditional land of a whole host of nations. This gathering originates in Atlantic Canada, which is the which is shared by the Wallistake, Passamaquoddy, Abenaki, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Inuit, and Innu nations. Here where I sit is Mi'kmaq. We try to honor the peace and friendship treaties here. We who are settlers realize that we have not always been respectable guests on this land or acted with justice and fairness, but we want to acknowledge with gratitude our hosts who are the original peoples of this land. We're also grateful to our creator who has placed us here to share this land and to work towards reconciliation and peace and to be good stewards of the land which sustains and gives us life. So just a little recap about yesterday. It was such a powerful evening. Um, I just, starting off with the video by Elle Jones, her in her work, Canada is so polite, reminding us that Canada is keeping up appearances and sharing this world with a multicultural facade while systemically oppressing black, indigenous and people of color every day. Then we heard from our panelists, uh, Denise Cole, Husoni Raymond, Tara Lewis, Brittany Drummond, and each shared current experiences within racism with racism that are based on oppressive roots that go back to first contact. Denise talked about the Lower Churchill hydroelectric project that is poisoning the river, supplying the food and water to indigenous communities and the ongoing impacts of residential schools and the children being taken in care and taken away from their homes and their cultures. Husoni talked about colonial experience of black people in Canada and the deliberate exclusion of black contributions to society that is now coming up microaggressions with things like, where are you from? And assuming this land is not their home. Tara talked about her personal experience on the front lines in Sonyaville with the fishing, Fisher's hate crimes, women acting as peacemakers and very much putting themselves in a position of absorbing the hate. And then they now have to process that to get healthy again. Brittany spoke of her personal experiences growing up, the inequities for black communities, like not having funds directed for infrastructure. So communities don't have things like paved roads, sidewalks, uh, street lights, crosswalks. But there was a theme that went, out, went through all four of the um, panelists last night. And that was about police and the justice system. It came through loud and clear and Denise and Hassoni talked about police becoming corporate security and being created to protect the white. Tara talked about the historical in, injunction that the settler fishers, uh, against the settler fishers because it was the first time the injunction was actually protecting the rights of the indigenous people. And that shouldn't be the exception. And then Brittany talked about the loopholes in the laws that are designed to harm black people we need to challenge these systemic issues and work together toward building right relationships. So a lot of challenging stuff, and but really good and really big stuff. So I'm looking forward to seeing what today brings and the actions that are gonna come out of this gathering as we move forward. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Diane. Um, Sony, welcome. Sony is just uh, Raymond is uh, one of our was one of our panelists last evening, and he is here the, to guide us in the next uh, section of our afternoon uh, with a, a serve. He's going to guide us through a, a series of questions. Sony is, uh, uh, as we know, is an educator, an activist. Um, and uh, an advocate who works for and was co-founder of Black Lives Matter Fredericton. And uh, Husoni, welcome with us, back with us this afternoon. And uh, I give you the, the screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And it's good to, to be back. Um, so this exercise is based on um, Peggy McIntosh's 
um, she wrote something called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Um, so it's a series of questions that allow us to kind of assess the varying degrees in which, you know, being white or non-Black has, um, or non-racialized has benefited us or some things that we don't even have to think about um, if, you, if you don't identify with the Black experience. So I'll start this um, exercise by reading, um, this is from uh, Peggy McIntosh herself, where she says, I've come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unlearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. So she's understanding white privilege as um, you know, assets, unlearned assets that she can cash in each day to make her life easier or her life was easier because of these things. Um, but she never realized um, because it, that they're not very obvious things. So she described white privilege as an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, codes, books, visa, clothes, tools, and blank checks that she could use um, and that she benefited from without even knowing. So she created a list of um, some questions that exposed or she thought exposed her um, privilege as a white person. So on this slide, I'm gonna just read out um, some of the, the sentences she has here. So she starts off, this is probably not the first one, but one of the ones that I selected is, if I, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Um, so that's an example that she had of white privilege was that she had the ability whenever she wanted to arrange to be in the company of white people because she lived in a predominantly white area. Number two, she says, I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. So I think before she kind of um, highlighted that she's able to move whenever she wanted and she's pretty sure that her neighbors in that location. Um, so she was talking about her ability to move wherever she wanted and be in a place where she know that people will be pleasant to her or even if they were not pleasant to her, it would not be a result of her skin. And this is kind of a result of the fact that, you know, there are a lot of neighborhoods that are not welcoming to racialized people, that racialized people up to still this day um, face discrimination. I was reading something in Ontario where the landlord found out, you know, it was all good to rent, but as soon as there was the viewing that was scheduled um, and they found out that the person was black, they suddenly made up an excuse that they weren't able to rent it, um, rent the apartment um, to them. So the third one is I can go shopping almost alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. So that's something that Black people have to constantly worry about is that they're being criminalized. It's the fact that you know, just the color of their skin implies that they are more prone to criminality or they're here to steal something. And if you speak to a lot of Black folks, um, they'll tell you about that fear um, of, of being stereotyped. I actually know an elder in my community who was racially profiled in shoppers and she uh, brought it, she was one of the brave people that brought it to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and it was proven that they were racially profiling her for steal stealing, like asking to see in her bag and when she didn't do anything. Um, number four, I can turn on the television or open the front page of the newspaper and see people of my race widely represented. So this is another privilege that Peggy talks about. It's the ability to turn on the TV, open the newspaper and, you know, see herself representing in all these social institutions, um, but black folks don't have, or racialized folks don't have this luxury because they're often um, excluded from, from participating in these, in these institutions. Five, when I am told about our national heritage or about civilization, I was shown that people of my race or color 
made it what it is. So again, as I was talking yesterday about the deliberate erasure um, of Black folks from, you know, history uh, in this case where, you know, the contributions of Black people are never taught in schools, you know, the contributions of Black loyalists and how they contributed to what we now know as Canada, the contributions of Indigenous people um, and the countless sacrifices that they've made are not taught in schools. It's always taught you know, Christopher Columbus came and he civilized this place and white people came and they civilized and that white people are to be thanked for, you know, what we have now. Uh, but the contributions of racialized people are never highlighted in that way. So that's also an example of white privilege. It's that you always, you felt empowered or, you know, <clears throat> just seeing yourself represented as doing good in society rather than always being represented as the, the, the people who you know, were uncivilized or who needed help from uh, white folks. And that was actually, this kind of white saverism is actually one of the main justifications for slavery. It was the fact that they thought that black folks were uncivilized um, and that you know, they were pagans and you know, they were actually doing them a favor by enslaving them because they were, um, introducing them to Christianity. So at least they'll go to heaven and they'll learn the, the ways, like the civilized ways. Um, so again, we see, you know, historically racialized people are, are, have been portrayed as the people in need of help or the uncivilized people, but the, the civilized people are the white folks who came and made things what they are today. So we can now click to um, slide three. So question six says, I can be assured that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to their exist to the existence of their race. So again, yesterday I was talking about, you know, black folks not being represented within the educational curriculum within New Brunswick um, and how that deliberate erasure of black people results in, um, you know, violence against them today, you know, not seeing yourself uh, represented in anything positive there, um, or that you've existed here for for centuries, not you know being constantly described as or assumed to be a newcomer uh, to this space. Number seven um, is I can be pretty sure of not having of I can be pretty sure of having my voice heard in a group in which I'm the only member of my race. So similar to, you know, the, the, the challenges that women face, you know, being the, the, the woman in the group, you know, a lot of times they're not listened to um, or their opinions are seen as invalid. That's what happens to a lot of racialized people is you're the only person in the group and you're voicing your opinion and people will discredit it uh, because of your race. Number eight, I can go into a music shop and count on finding music of my race represented in the supermarket and find the staple foods which fit my cultural traditions um, into the hairdresser shop and find someone who can cut my hair. So our entire society, <laughs> so our entire society was um, shaped around, you know, the needs of, of white folks. So, you know, a lot of black folks here can find people to kid, that can do their hair well you know, can't find their foods represented in the grocery store. It's mostly, you know, Italian pasta and all that. But, you know, what about, you know, traditional food from the countries they're from? Um, so that's just an, another example um, of white privilege. And I'd also like, I should have prefaced this exercise by saying that having white privilege doesn't mean you're a bad person. Um, and it doesn't mean that you've never, you know, struggled any time in your life. Um, it just means that there's some things that you never were never a barrier to you or you never had to worry about. So for instance, just the food, finding a comfort food that you know fits with your tradition, that's just something that you know you never had to worry about or think about. And that's you know the lived experiences of racialized people in you know these predominantly white countries. Nine, whether I use checks credit cards or cash, I can count on my skin color not working against me 
in the appearance of uh, financial responsibility. So black folks are, and racialized folks in general are um, constantly stereotyped as being, you know, unreliable, you know, financially and their, their financial status is always uh, put into question. 10, I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. So if you do have kids, you know, like a lot of um, kids face, I've heard so much, all the black folks that I've actually uh, had conversation with tells you about, you know, being marginalized because of the color of their skin within the, the education system. And, you know, how disempowering it is for parents to actually be seeing this and they can't really have a, a, a big say in, in how can you, you change this, this system. And the question number 11 says, I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. So we talked yesterday about, you know, state violence against racialized people. And this is actually a conversation that a lot of, um, you know, racialized parents have to have with their children. It's about, you know, systemic racism and what to do when you interact with the police and how a sudden movement can result in their, um, their harm and, and brutalization. Um, so, you know, when I was coming here, my mom had to talk to me about, you know, police violence in, in North America and um, that reality, those difficult conversations, um, and not just in policing, but also in education and healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Number 12 is, I can be pretty sure that my children's teachers and employers will tolerate them if they fit school and workplace norms. My chief worries about them do not concern others' attitudes towards their race. So again, a lot of parents have to think about, you know, when they enlist their kids to school and when they send them out in the workforce, they have to think about the fact that they will face barriers because of their, their race and the attitudes that um, will, will arise from the color of their skin. And a lot of parents have to worry about that. 13 is I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. So a lot of black folks are constantly and racialized folks. Oh, you're very smart for um, an indigenous person. You're very articulate for a black person. You're very pretty for a black person. You know, you're, you're seen, if you um, do well in anything, you're seen as above the standard or the average black person. Actually, I have a, a poem that I could share with you that um, by this poet that talks about the average black girl. You know, she, she gets constantly complimented like saying, you're not the average black girl for doing the most simple things. If she speaks standard English, you're not the average black girl. You're so well-spoken, um, poised, full of etiquette. Um, all of this, these things as if, you know, the, the standard for black people is, um, less than than average or less than um, less than good. Number 14, I'm never asked to speak for all people of my racial group. And that's a reality of a lot of racialized people. They're in university classrooms, you know, if you're the only or one of two black people, as soon as the topic of race comes up, you're expected to be the spokesperson um, for your entire race, which can be a lot of pressure. You know, what if I don't know about systemic injustices? Like I'm assumed to be an expert um, and speed assumed to be the voice of people of my entire racial group. Number 15 is I can be pretty sure that if I, if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I'll be facing a person of my race. And this is something Peggy points out is that, um, you know, black folks are, are not given are rarely given uh, positions of authority and promotion. Um, so majority of the people in charge will be people that look like you or people that are, are white. So number 16 is if a traffic cop pulls me over, 
or if the IRS audits my tax returns, I can be sure that I haven't been singled out because of my race. And that there's a lot of racial profiling within these institutions, like, you know, Black folks are just seen as suspicious. So the, the color of your skin results in over policing and over um, suspicion. Number 17 says, I can easily buy posters, postcards, pictures, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race. So again, a lot of Black folks grew up not seeing themselves represented on anything. You know, all the dolls, now it's kind of changing where you have um, racialized dolls. But when I was growing up, I never saw my sister with, <clears throat> with a racialized doll. All the standards of beauty um, with the dolls were, were centered around, you know, Eurocentric beauty standards and white people. So everything you are seeing, every, every image that was represented in a positive light was more than likely going to be of a white person there. So just seeing yourselves represented throughout your childhood um, can help your self-esteem and help your, your confidence and something you never had to question. Number 18, I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to feeling somewhat tied to feeling somewhat tied in rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, or held at the distance <clears throat> or feared. <laughs> So again, another example of um, just being able to fit in within an organization and how a lot of Black folks feel out of place within these institutions um, because of the color of their skin and the fact that, you know, they're always seen as the odd one out or if they mention something about, you know, racial injustice or um, just mention how a policy or a certain comment is inappropriate, they are seen as, you know, the sh I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word. What can I say? Um, the problem maker or the, the person that's just, you know, trying to start conflict. So they end up feeling marginalized and outnumbered or it's um, seen as not a big issue. Number 19, if I declare there's a racial, okay, I go right into that. If they declare there's a racial, if I declare there's a racial issue at hand or that there isn't a racial issue at hand, my race will lend more credibility for either position than the person of color will have. That means that, <clears throat> you know, a lot of situations is sometimes when Black people point out injustices within their organizations, they're seen as overreacting or it's not about race, you're overthinking it. Um, but that's why it takes allies sometimes to call out racism because when it's from coming from a white person, it's seen as more Credible, but when it comes on, come from a black person, they're seen as the angry black woman or the black person or racialized person that's just um, seeking trouble and it's not about race. 20 is I can worry about racism without being seen as self interest, interested or self seeking. So, you know, like a lot of times when racialized people talk about racism, it's seen as, oh, you're just interested in this for yourself because you can get publicity or um, benefit from it in, 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 in some way. Um, so yeah, that's also, you know, a form of privilege where you can worry about issues um, and not see, be seen as, you know, in it for your own gain per se. And I have another slide, but I think we can, we, I think folks get the point with uh, 20, 20 of the, the questions here or the statements here. And just recognizing the comment here saying, it took us years to find an ethnic store when we first came. We cried when our in-laws sent us a care package of Nigerian foods. It was like Christmas. Yeah, like you, you're here. And even when I came here, you know, like I'm just, everything that I was used to my, you know, cultural foods. And then it was just all food that, you know, was not native to me. You couldn't find that. So imagine how isolating and how food, we don't really think about it, but food is a really big part of our identities as, as people um, and coming in these predominantly white spaces that don't even cater um, to your needs, you know, even hair products, you know, it's all products that are suitable for white hair. You go to Walmart and there's a little section 
um, that does not meet your, your needs that you need to, to groom and sustain yourself. So just being able to go into any store and find, um, you know, projects that suit your, your needs um, and fulfill your desires is a, is a immense privilege. And the funny thing is, if you went to, if, when white people go to predominantly racialized countries, more than likely they're going to be able to find um, their preferred foods as well there because of the universality of, of whiteness and um, the global structure there. Thanks so much, Lusani. So we're gonna to go to our panel. Lid, do you have any words of introduction? Or are we passing directly to Denise? No, I think I'll, I'll say a few words. First of all, it's a mini session which will allow the panel to talk about these things in more detail. The speakers are, excuse me for a second, Denise Cole, who's a two-spirited protector of mixed Inuit descent from Southern Labrador, who's only what you've already heard of, who is a graduate of St. Thomas University and a co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement in Fredericton. Brittany Drummond, who's an African-Canadian born and raised in Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia. And Tara Lewis, who's from the Eskazoni First Nations in Umakinona's Cape Breton Island. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're going to tell us. And I'll just jump in here to say um, regrets from Tara. She is sick, as we could tell she was getting last night. So she um, is not able to be with us. Good afternoon or morning, depending on, I guess, where you all are. I'm really glad to be back and to be, uh, to be speaking again today. So I think that the question that we were talking about is, is what does being an ally or what do, you know, from my perspective as an Indigenous person, what do we need from allies? Am I, am I close on what the question is, Shannon? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. All right, perfect. So uh, I always uh, say this, and, and actually uh, Hosani brought this up as well, I don't speak for all Indigenous people. I can only speak for my own experience as uh, an Inuit uh, two-spirit person that lives here in Labrador. Uh, I, I work with a lot of allies, and uh, it's, it's, it is very important of how we do this reconciliation work together and how we build uh, better communities and uh, better nations. So I think what I look for, what I, if I were to put out sort of that request of uh, for from allies, it's uh, a humility to learn, and to also to you know not to be afraid to challenge stereotypes when they're seen, including when they see them being expressed by themselves. Uh, that we're able to, you know, learn together. And I have found some of the, the most beautiful relationships I've built, including with uh, one of my best friends who's on here, which is Diane, how we met was her as an ally, a settler coming into our community and uh, wanted to sit and share energy. And, and that's built a very beautiful friendship. So I think friendship is also a part of that. It's not just how do we um, you know, utilize each other. <laughs> it really is how do we build relationship together to understand as well that one cannot speak for all. So the working together and finding the diversity and uh, being able to say, oh, okay, so I have this one indigenous person I know, or this one person of color I know. So I'll always go ask them. Um, and with that said, there is certainly, you know, uh, relationships where you find those knowledge holders or those people of wisdom who can help guide you and connect you. And that's really important. So it's to know that you, you need to be diversifying yourself to, re to reach out. So it's not just, oh, well, this is what one told me now. That's where my learning ends. Um, to understand that we're not always going to agree. And that's okay. It's how we choose to find the common ground where we can work together, heal together, uh, to do better together. And it's gonna take a diversity of approaches to do that. So there comes also that understanding that I can't have all the answers, neither can you. And so it's how we build this circle together. And uh, I think if there was, there was you know, anything else, it would be to understand, and one of the things that I, I say quite often in, in ceremony and in the work and the things that I do is that to remember that Mother Earth gave birth to us all, that we are all humans. And so from, from that scope, if we can remember that we are all from the same Earth 
And in doing that, then we start to take down some of these borders and the walls uh, that have kind of boxed us in. So I think also, you know, understanding colonization and being able to kind of, um, I mean, I'm of mixed descent, right? So I have English, Welsh roots, as well as indigenous, so Inuit roots. And I've had to reconcile the trauma that came from blood memory within my indigenous side of my family, but also to learn to reconcile and, and sit with the truth of the trauma that was inflicted by my ancestors of the English side. So we do work through a, a level of, uh, I, some people would call it guilt or shame or these sorts of things. So it's being able to uh, sit with that, but in a way that we start to move forward to look for peace and solutions. Uh, I know there's others who are going to speak, uh, recognizing now a tarragon, bringing an indigenous voice. So I, I think it is, um, yeah, it's important that you seek out others who are first peoples of the lands that you live and work and raise your families on, that you are open yourself to that that learning as well is really important. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Denise. We will now hear from Hosoni. Thank you. Um, so I guess allyship is such a a big um, a big topic. I don't think I would be able to go into everything within four to five uh, minutes. But I say at the the core of allyship, it's about um, understanding and respect. Um, so I think if you want to be an ally, I think first of all, it's not resorting to white saviorism to say you know, I know best for you. I, I know um, how to fix these issues and this is what I'm gonna do to address it, but more listening to the marginalized person to say, you know, how would you like to be supported? How do you envision us tackling this issue um, together? So it's about, you know, listening and beyond tokenization, not just, you know, having them there and then not incorporating anything they say, but it's there and then listening and meaningfully um, enacting upon what, whatever they, they recommend and resisting, you know, acknowledging the privilege that comes with being white and resisting that white savior role that I'm helping or not, that I'm saving, you know, these people or, you know, because they don't need a savior, they need people that are able to stand beside them, listen to them and uplift um, them in any way they possible, in any way they can. And if they're not there, um, then someone that can be an advocate on their behalf. Um, so I'll just go into ways in which um, we can be better allies. Um, and the first thing I'd say is to um, recognize the intention versus the impact. And I feel like a lot of people keep think, you know, they say like, I'm a good person. So um, that's my excuse. Like you make a joke that someone says, you know, from a marginalized group and they say that's inappropriate or um, you do something and they say that's inappropriate and you're like, well, I'm a good person. That was not my intention, but not because it wasn't your intention means that it didn't have that negative impact that they're saying it does. So I feel like it's important for us when we're being called in to not make the conversation about or feelings and us, um, but it's 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 about listening and empathizing and not getting defensive. Then recognizing that you know I made a mistake there and it had this impact, even if that was not what I intended. And then listening to the person, acknowledging the harm, apologizing, and then seeing how you can do better and move forward in the in the future. Um, as Denise recognized that, you know, we can't speak for all racialized people. Um, and that's another thing that allies get frustrated if, you know, one person says, this is how I'd like to be um, supported, but then another group is like, I don't care, or um, this is how I'd like to be supported in another way. And allies kind of get frustrated. They're like, well, you're giving me so many different um, demands, but it's recognizing that not all people want allyship won't look the same for all people. So recognizing that and being an ally to different folks in ways that they um, want to, to be supported. Um, and 
The last thing I'd say too with um, allyship from an organizational perspective is that um, listen to grassroots people, listen to the people who are on the ground. A lot of times we um, get people who, you know, have all these accolades or the successful black person to speak on behalf of black person on what allyship should be like, but they're out of touch. They have a, a socioeconomic protection um, from the realities of majority of racialized people. So making sure that your allyship and what you're doing is kind of grounded in, uh, depending on the context, of course, but if you can involve grassroots community organizers, make sure that you're building those relationships with, um, with community. And I think um, that would be, I think I'm, I think I'm over time, so I'll just um, cut it there. Again, Huzoni, thank you so much for your wisdom and uh, giving us a lot to think about. And now we'll move on and have Brittany speak to us. I guess I would say my, my view of allyship is the one thing that I would like is in uncomfortable situations, I would like those around to just speak up and use their voice. Um, and I don't mean to offend anybody when I say this, but for those who have the white privilege to use it, to put yourself out there and give a voice, like give a voice. I'm not trying to undo what Hassani said either, but like give a voice if it's needed. If, if you're in the mall and anybody of BIPOC is being accused of stealing, let them know their rights. Like let them know that they don't have to show their bags when it's being demanded. Um, that they can request to have the police there. They can request to have a manager present, like that they have those rights available. Because one thing for sure is in, in the moment, you forget your rights. And I can say it probably has happened to me where for, for a split second, I forgot. And then I'm also very stubborn that I've just said no. <laughs> um, but it's, we need more pe people out there to voice what is going on in the world, what is going on in our backyard. It's not right. And the more that people question it, the more eyes will be brought to the situation that, you know, especially with police brutality, it may lead them to second guess themselves and it could stop a situation. Um, so for me, that is that is what I ask for an ally is someone who is willing to speak up <laughs> with me and saying that this is wrong. And I'm not saying that means leading to violent protesting, but when there is a protest, get out there, show your support. Um, if you if you don't understand, question it so that we can help you understand. It's the best way I can explain it. That's really all I have to say about Alicia. But my mom has something to say too. Well, just if you happen to witness any violence, especially police brutality, make sure you ask the victim for permission to film it, but pull out your phones and film it. Yes, yeah, so please. that we have proof that this has happened. Legally, you do have to get consent of at least one person within the video so that if your video is sequestered to be in court, it will hold up in court. So as long as you, you, have, you can identify yourself, you would be considered one person in the video, but you should also get the person who is either being attacked or whatever it may be just explain that you are doing this to okay. shed light on the situation for them and ask if you have their consent to film them. They will most likely say yes anyways, um, but that way it will legally stand up in court. Certainly an awful lot to absorb and to think about. Thank you all for what you've shared. And now I believe we're gonna move on to working through scenarios in small groups. Thank you so much, panelists. And now 
it's everyone's turn to talk and to share. Um, so we all uh, received some uh, scenarios. You should have received some scenarios via email last night. Um, so the idea here is the scenarios are actually written very clearly to explain just what would you do in this situation. There's some three different everyday situations. And so here's the, here's the part to remember. When you are placed in a group, look at the screen and look at what group number you're, pu you're put in. And your group should look at the scenario that has the same number. Okay, group one looks at scenario one, etc. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good, vigorous discussion in your groups. Now, I am in, was in group one, so I'm going to say a little bit about what we talked about because I was the note taker as well as the person who's doing the facilitating the discussion. Ours was a, uh, a, a you enter a clothing store, a staff member is following a group of teenagers who are black. And so uh, they're asked to uh, show that they haven't stolen anything and you're watching. So there was an, an interesting group of comments. The first was that we might feel that this was a normal thing to keep an eye on teenagers. So I would ask for help. A second person said, I would look at the sales work and would assume that they would have seen something because of their color. Another one was because this person knows about racialization, they would ask, what justification do you have? But then what is interesting is uh, the discussion came up, was this about racialization or was it about an ageism where they were actually identifying teenagers who they suspected so there's kind of a double image there. A uh, comment was made about a former uh, Nova Scotia Lieutenant Gen uh, Governor who follows, often follows when she's shopping. And finally, this whole thing of reverse discrimination and, uh, and a, a, another example of someone in the store who was called shoplifting, a, a young mother with children, but another person had videoed it so they were able to see what had actually happened and see that it actually was this kind of racialized experience. So it was a wide ranging and very interesting discussion. Uh, group two. We had a different uh, scenario. Um, our scenario was you're waiting in the wait, you are in the waiting room of a hospital emergency department. You've been there for quite some time now and there are quite a people waiting a BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, or person of color enters and they are disoriented, stumbling over their words and actions. While they approach the clerk station asking for help, you hear the hospital clerk call for security. Security comes and approaches a person, loudly stating that this is not the homeless shelter and they need to leave. The individual is saying they need medical help and their words are slurred and they have, are having trouble standing. Mm. Security in turn instructs the clerk to call the RCMP as they grab the person's arm and begin to walk them out into the hallway away from the waiting room. So what would you do? And the generic answer that we all came up with was we like, he deserves to be triaged um, to find out if there is actually something wrong. You know, if he, is drunk or on drugs then test his blood to confirm um one question was well who would you if you were to speak up and say something who would you say it to and so we discussed you have to say it to both the security guard but as well as the the, the clerk nurse the nurse at the clerk desk or the nurse within the triage um, that they deserve to be treated. And I even said, like, at some point, you might even have to stand between the security guard and the patient to make sure that the security guard doesn't continue to uh, take the patient out of the hospital. Um, but but that, was, that was generally 
that we would speak up and and say that they needed to be treated. Thank you. It's a really provocative scenario. And now we'll hear from group three. Yeah, so our, the scenario that our group was talking about was um, a traffic stop um, that basically escalated to the point where the police were attacking the driver who was a person of color um, and eventually tasered this individual. Um, and so we talked a lot about how we would feel first in that situation um, and, you know, that it would be kind of overwhelming, um, but then started to talk about some different strategies. Um, and Denise had lots of great experience and ideas to throw in there. Um, so thinking about things like um, filming the event um, and then asking questions. So asking police officers, um, oh, what is your badge number or what is your name? Mm. Who is your supervisor? Um, things that, you know, will help you, but also will sort of reroute their brain and help them remember that they're part of a system that can hold them accountable. Um, engaging the bystanders who are there, so asking people to check on the other people who are in the vehicle um, and, and asking them, you know, to call 911 because someone has been tasered and so they're going to need an ambulance and medical care. Um, yeah, so we talked, yeah, just a lot about asking different questions and getting lots of different people involved um, so that hopefully the, the situation de-escalates. Again, thank you very much. Now we'll finally hear from the fourth group. Only oh, had three. Wow. <laughs> That's wonderful. So now- I wonder the if there are any other, anybody else wants to add anything? Oh, okay. I see Elizabeth there. Um, I do just want to say one more thing. If okay. That's possible. Okay, Brittany. Um, so when I said that I would step up and uh, step up in between the security guard and the patient, I do want to clarify. I'm never going to tell someone to step into the way of what could be a possible dangerous situation. However, I am also fully trained with St. John Ambulance that I'm trained for like for that specific situation. So I would feel comfortable to do it. But again, never as much as we would like you to stand up and, and put yourself in a position that could be dangerous to yourself. That's all I want to say. PSA kind of thing. <laughs> okay, now Elizabeth. Uh as I've listened to all of us <laughs> in the various conversations, scenarios, I, um, I'm struck with how, uh, I don't know what the word is, brave we think we be. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like uh, because we're kind of sitting in a circle where we're, uh, you know, I, I'm, always aware that if I'm in a group and everybody agrees, we're in trouble. <laughs> One of the things that I appreciated uh, uh, that um, I think Denise, you said is that allies, we have to know we're not all gonna agree. But um, one of the things that uh, struck me as, I, as I've li listened is I wonder if we really, like the conversation in our scenario, and I was in group two, um, we didn't get to the root of why the person felt the need in the first place to call the security guard. Mm -hmm. like, it, like we responded to the situation, but we didn't dig deep enough and perhaps it was because we didn't have enough time <laughs> in our group to kind of ask that kind of question of, you know, why, why would the hospital clerk in the very beginning, which started the scenario, find it necessary when this person arrived that instead of doing the job of checking them in, so to speak, that they, they bothered to call security. Mm -hmm. like, uh, or, you know, in, in the situations like we're here to be 
talking and wrestling with our uh, our own um, uh, journey around how we understand each other <laughs> and how I we understand. And anyhow, I think we should move on to other speakers. There's two others on the list. Uh, Shagun. Oh, I just wanted to address what Elizabeth said. You know, um, I think my own um, upbringing, training and everything is stop the flow first, stop the blood flow, and then look for the causes later. Just make sure that the emergency is applied. In this situation, this cell is going to be on the streets very soon or wherever. And I have to step in at that very moment. I'd rather wipe mud off my face afterwards if mm -hmm. I was wrong. So that was what I wanted to say. Interesting, Denise? we've assumed the person that we came in was male. You're right. But let's move on to Denise. She, she's on the list. Yes, uh, and it is interesting, the different sort of uh, the natural assumptions. And this is why I said cha challenging sometimes those inner things that we have. Um, and I, I, I think what I wanted to bring, there was this idea of, uh, and I brought it up in the group, this idea of learning to create calm, like to understand like your, like to keep your calm uh is become sort of really critical in situations like this and it's interesting because like what i'm hearing here and what happens uh and it's natural this is a part of why i believe we're doing this together is individuals who would could never imagine uh being in a situation like this or having something like this happen to them as opposed to those of us who have not only imagined but have probably seen bared witness or actually experienced situations like this these scenarios came from us uh that are you know that wrote these <laughs> i wrote the hospital one in particular because i have had that happen many times where i've been in the waiting room and i've learned how i would do things differently um so it's uh and i don't want to be like the doom and gloom because our first natural reaction to hearing things like this there's a uncomfortableness that we will use humor or we will use something so that we don't feel what we're feeling. Um, just like when you learn first aid, part of learning first aid is learning how would you react so that you could role play, you could imagine, you practice these things so that if the real thing happens, you're prepared for it. Um, and as we talk about how we become good allies, it's, it's that. Because these moments that we're talking about, they might not be always extreme as seeing somebody get tasered. And, but I tell you, these things happen around us all the time. It's putting the lens on to learn how we're going to handle and respond to them when they happen. Because I, I like with our scenario, there was a secondary thing, which is what if you were watching this on the news and people around you started saying things that you knew were inappropriate? Like, how would you deal with that? But anyway, I don't want to go into a big long piece of it, but it's it's kind of remember the essence of, of what we're doing and and almost looking at things as a first aid approach because that's really for some of us this is life and death, um, and we can't forget that. As someone who worked in a hospital situation, that situation is not that uncommon, and the first rule that security guards are taught is you reduce the anxiety, you simplify. You try to minimize the frustration and the anger. And that's what we try to do by opening the discussion and in a sense pulling it back a bit, then bad things are less likely to happen. But to certainly go in the middle of a, of a discussion like that is not a good idea because that escalates and that will cause one or the other side to, to lash out. Uh, yeah, I... I, I... I've been in been in a situation similar as well. So, I mean, I I, I do think it's yeah. Uh, anyway, let's just. I think that um, we're we're learning what it what it means to be um, allies. What it mm. what it, we're learning what it means to be human. <laughs> to really, I mean, for me, that's what I, where I am kind of landing in all this is I'm learning what it means to 
to actually love my neighbor. <laughs> you know, to start from a place of under uh, accepting this, accepting the other, and then I'm going to understand them. If I don't accept the other as they present, then I'll never understand. I think as as those who live in white bodies, um, that we have a particular responsibility in these times to to take these things like the list that Hussani gave us and the, these scenarios like constantly we we need to retrain our brains our 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 bodies to to be able to get in like to come alongside to create safety right like to 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 we want to go to our heads to to do the analysis of the why but i think we've really got to train our minds to see Oh, wait, who's really vulnerable here? Who's the most vulnerable person in this situation, right? How do we, how do we use this privilege of be, living in a white body to, to mm -hmm. be, you know, and, and sometimes it's like, I, I wanted to say earlier, one of the greatest um, uh, descriptions of allyship that I heard recently was constantly learning to, to figure out when to, come alongside when to stand in front of like so to be protecting and when to get behind like <laughs> to get the heck out of the way of uh bipoc folk you know who in their own in their own strength so when to when to really get have their backs and and when to to uh, step in for their protection and and when to just be alongside so that uh, and that takes relationships and make mistakes sometimes Sorry, I just blah, 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 extrovert. I've been quiet too long. <laughs> I I think that we're reaching a point in the discussion where we could carry on for a long time, or maybe it's time to take what we've learned and to bring it home with us and to ponder what we're going to do with it. Because this has been a very rich discussion. So now I'll move it on to uh, Diane, who's going to be no, sorry, Elizabeth, who's going to be uh, closing. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Here I am again. Um, I, 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 uh, I think that uh, what you've just said, Lid, is is really kind of uh, summarize it. What you said and Laura said, and and what everyone has said together this afternoon and last evening is been rich, and we all have to hear with head and heart. And now I'll say, so what? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what difference does it make that I took the time to be present in these, in this gathering with each of you? And what am I gonna do now? And, uh, uh, I think we each in our own heart and being have ideas. And uh, so uh, please don't uh, let this time go as something that you check your list and say, well, I did that. That's good for me. I hope that we've been pushed a little farther than that. And uh, as I have the privilege of looking at you all now, I know that we are gonna go away from this time together and say, look at what, how, how will we be different? Um, I, I just got a note to ask that if, any of you have um, any local or regional justice uh, events you're aware of that you would like the rest of us to know about, please put those in the chat so that we all can become aware of that, those things. I have asked Denise to lead us in a a closing but Diane I know has one more thing I think to do before uh Denise you 
um, closed for us. Perfect. Uh, so, so what? That was great words, Elizabeth. I like those. So what? Um, <laughs> so if you're looking for what, why don't you join us at Kairos Atlantic? Um, if you're in this region, you are always welcome to join the the committees that are trying to um, bring work in racial justice in all sorts of different areas, indigenous justice, mining justice, um, to light in Atlantic Canada. So in any of the four Atlantic provinces, if you are interested in doing that, I'm going to request that you email me and I will put you in contact with the person closest to you geographically um, to connect with. So I put my email address in the chat. It's a very long name. I apologize, uh, but please just copy and paste it so that you've got it and contact me anytime. You can also find me at MCC online. Um, Diane Atlantic is my MCC Facebook page. So if you want to, you can connect with me there as well. Denise, thank you. I'm holding the candles, Denise. Ah, you must be <laughs> feeling my mind or reading my, my energy. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to all of you. I'd like it just before, and I will, um, I will close in prayer. It's uh, it's a it's a it's been gifted to me. But in in a moment, I would just like everyone to just give, put your hand to your heart or where you believe your heart to be, <laughs> uh, and just take that that internal count of five to feel your heartbeat, to feel grounded that we all feel grounded with each other. And I'm going to stay silent for a moment. Let us all be centered here together in the work that we've done, how we've shared, the energy and the traumas, the memories, the healing, the truths that we all hold within us and we hold it together. And I'm going to say a short prayer uh, for those who wish. Creator, I thank you for bringing us together in this moment. I thank you for the ancestors that have been sitting here with us and helping speak through us. I say prayers for the next generations because that's really the work that we do. It's, it's about what the world is that we leave for them. I thank you for everyone who's come here. I ask that you keep them safe. I ask that you wrap that love and healing and truth and energy around all of us in the circle, collectively and individually as we leave from here today. Whether we travel home or just move from one room to another within our own homes, that we hold this healing with us and this becomes how we walk a journey together. I thank you for the allies. I thank you for the people who have come and shared their pain and their stories and their realities as those of us who are from or being black or indigenous or people of color. I pray for a deep, deep healing and also for it to move to action creator, an action that we make things better and do things in a better way. And we know we can do that together and with you and through this mother earth, that Turtle Island becomes a place that we can all be more proud of. Not to make all my relations, amen. Thank you, everyone. I don't want to blow these out Elizabeth, we say in, in solidarity, one of the things, there's a ceremony I do called fire and water. And it says that sometimes keeping the balance of both, you know, so that when you allow your breath to put out that flame, that's moisture, that's water, it is part of the healing work. Because we can't keep a fire burning all the time. There has to be balance. So it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the permission I needed.